I want to thank everyone for coming out this evening to come out and study a portion of God's Word and, and try and apply it to our lives and make us better Christians. I also want to thank the elders for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. So as you can see behind me, tonight's lesson is entitled, Being a Friend. Making this lesson, I kind of wondered, what, what is the definition of, of a friend? Well, I went to dictionary.com and looked at what the definition of a friend was. Well, the first definition is a person attached to another by feelings of affection or personal regard. And this can be anybody that might have, might have done something nice for you or has really stuck with you for a while and, and, you, and it builds that personal regard or that affection for that person. The second one is a person who gives assistance, patron, or supporter. Um, I'm sure that here lately we've had a bunch of parades and such. Well, the Wheeling Parade, it's the uh, supporter, a patron is Perkins. And so them being such a help makes them a friend to the, the parade. And the next definition is a member of the same party, nation, etc. Just kind of like um, the United States. Everybody, when we go into battle, everybody that's fighting for the United States is a friend. You know, called if you fire on the other person that's on the same team as you, that's friendly fire, and that's not very friendly. Doesn't look like this is going to be working. Let's turn that off. Okay. The next definition um, was is a person who is in good terms with another, a person who is not hostile. This can go back to the days of castles and knights and such, and they might surround the castle and the watchman might shout out to the people that's surrounding, who goes there, friend or foe? Well, if they're surrounding it, it's probably going to be a foe and they're not going to be a friend. And the final definition, and I think is probably one that is probably kind of used loosely, would be a person associated with another as a contact on a social networking site, such as Facebook, Twitter, the list goes on. Um, you might get a request from somebody that you haven't seen in years, but you know they were friends in, in school maybe, and you probably accepted them as a friend because, well, they haven't, like we've seen earlier, done anything hostile to you or done anything to lose your trust. So let's keep these definitions in mind as we go. The first people we need to be a friend to are non-Christians, and that isn't always easy, especially when it isn't reciprocated back to us at all times. We may not be attached emotionally or on good terms with the other, but we still have an obligation to be a friend. We shouldn't be hostile, and we, shouldn't, and we should be willing to give assistance. So let's first look at it from a kindness perspective. And turn with me to Luke chapter 10, and in verse 27. Luke 10, and in verse 27. So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. So we can see here that we are to treat others as we want to be treated. Wouldn't we want to be treated kindly? And it isn't always easy because sometimes we have bad days. Everybody has bad days. And it can make it really, really hard to be that good example that we should be. Um, I know in my personal experience at work, I have one guy in particular that is just real hard to get along with. You, know, he, you just ask him a question and he just kind of ignores you and just keeps going on his business. But I try and if he go, he's going on a job, be like, hey, you need any help? Or, you know, in passing, just talk to him, kind of try and make small talk just kind of trying to be that good example. 
showing that I, I want to be his friend. In Matthew 5, verses 13 and 16, we can see how, how we should be. Matthew 5, verses 13 and 16. Starting in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. If you are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So, as we can see there, we need to be that, that bright and shining example to a lost and dying world. Think of uh, just maybe like a cave. We went to a cave one time and, and they shut out all the lights. Pitch dark, you can't even see the hand in front of your face. And then they turn on that light. That's what we need to be, that, that light in the dark world. And part of that darkness is... Maybe people that aren't very nice, mean people. They're not very. They're not very tasteful. They're bland. And but a kind and friendly person, they can bring seasoning into that friendship and hopefully seasoning to maybe spread the gospel. And we are to be the light that shines Jesus' love to others, even when we aren't actively talking about Jesus. Our actions still should be. And. Just like salt doesn't take much to season, neither does yeast. And that is how we should be. We can see that in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 9. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 9. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Pretty simple statement there. And I'm, sh I'm sure some of us, or all of us, have seen or made bread ourselves. You, have, you start out with this little, little ball of dough, and the amount of yeast it takes is only, only a little bit in a, in a small batch, maybe a couple of teaspoons. But if you set that aside in the right conditions and let it grow, what's it do? It doubles in size. Well... We should be the same way. We need to be that yeast in the world and hopefully grow the kingdom of God. And there's a commercial out about uh, an insurance company, and it's about paying it forward. You know, somebody sees a, a lady having groceries and wanting to cross the street, and they, they hold it for them, and they go across the street. Well, somebody else might see that, and, and they go to the store, and they do something else nice. And we need to be the same thing because we, that, that would be, make it easier for us to spread the gospel. <clears throat> and turn with me to Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6. Colossians 4, verses 5 and 6. Starting in verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. So, when we talk to our friends, we need to talk to them with kindness. And we should always talk to everyone with kindness. And hopefully that, that kindness, that, that careful saying with your words, can maybe spur someone to do the right thing because what's easier to listen to somebody that's not speaking kindly to you or somebody that's speaking kindly to you well it's a no brainer it's somebody that's speaking kindly to you and the next person group of people that we need to be friends to are our fellow Christians and we need to be friends because we are fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and we can see that example in Matthew chapter 12, verses 48 and 50. Matthew chapter 12, 
verses 48 and 50. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand toward all of his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother, is my brother, sorry, and sister and mother. So we can see here that if we are part of God's family, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we need to act like it. I've seen sometimes where we maybe we don't always act like it. You know, people going behind each other's back and talking, you know, instead of if somebody has a problem with something, just go to the person. Talk to them. It can so, solve so much heartache. We do the same thing, hopefully, with our, our worldly family. If somebody is, we have a problem with, hopefully we go to them and, and fix it and resolve it. And we are that family, and well, that family unit, it's one body. And please turn to Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. Romans 12, 4 and 5. We can see that description of, of the one body. Romans chapter 12, 4 and 5. For as we have many members in one body... But all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. So, if we're one body, what happens when, say, you know, you're walking through and you might stub your toe on something, and it hurts? What happens? Your body goes to the aid to that, that piece that's been hurt. You might put ice on it, put the, make the swelling go down, comfort it, support it. Well, the same thing should happen in our spiritual family. Somebody hurt, somebody's hurt, somebody's not doing so well. We need to be at their aid and try and do what we can for them. And the way we create that family bond by having fellowship with one another. And in sharing that fellowship with Christians, we are surrounding ourselves with, with good a good influence, something positive. And if we surround with good, we are more likely to stay that way. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and in verse 33. Simply put, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Now this isn't saying that we can outright just do away with evil and totally avoid it because that's not possible in today's, today's world because we still have jobs that we have to go to, we have to schools we have to go to. But it's more warning against spending extra amounts of time with evil companions because hopefully if we're doing our job or doing our school right we don't really have that much time to engage in those evil acts or bad influences don't get me wrong they, they are there but not as much as say if a co-worker asks you to maybe go to the bar after work or somebody at school wants you to go to a party after work after school where there's drugs alcohol bad, you know, sexual immorality, the list goes on and on. So, <clears throat> like we can see, we are warned that it's evil company corrupts good habits. And it can kind of be compared to that loaf of bread that you put into your bread box and you check on it a few weeks later and what happens? It starts to mold. Well, that mold is like that evil, and what happens when it's left? If you put it back in there like that, it's just going to spread throughout the rest of the bread and just ruin the whole thing. And just like our spiritual lives, that evil can ruin our spiritual lives. And going back to fellowship with one another is good because it makes it 
easier to know one another's struggles. And turn with me to Galatians 6 and verse 23. Galatians 6 and in verse 23, we can see how we are supposed to share one another's burdens. Galatians 6 and in verse tw- or 2, sorry about that. Galatians 6, verse, ver- verse 2 through 3. Galatians 6, 2 through 3. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. So there again, we can see that we need to share one another's burdens. I'm going to pick one kin a little bit here. Um, we can we can confide each other with our, our marriages. You know, I can be like, you know, Nicole, she's really, really being annoying right now, and and Kenny can be like, you know, it's all right. Paul is, Paul is like that too. It, it'll be all right. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and we can't do it alone, just like we need each other. And we can, I've picked out a few examples to iterate that. And the first one is Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. <laughs> Ecclesiastes 9, and in verse 4, 9 and 12. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 12. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a three-fourth cord is not quickly broken. And again, over in Proverbs 27 and 17. Proverbs 27 and 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And in one final one, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. <clears throat> And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I think this is probably the most important one out of the group, because it's, it's talking about the importance of, of not forsaking the assembly, coming together. That's part of building that bond, that relationship with one another to help each other through with burdens, to help each other through trying times. It's like the examples we looked at. It's like iron, sharpening iron, or the example before that. It's like that cord, that three cord. It's, it's not easily broken. And that's the same way with, with worship. People in the world, they, they sometimes don't understand. They're like, man, you go to, you go to church three times a week? Sunday? Sunday night? Wednesday? Man, you're, you're crazy. But we need to do it for our spiritual health. And it's good for us. And not only is it good for us, but it's commanded of us. And I know that Wellsburg is, seems like it's a pretty, pretty good about that. I know when I, when I wasn't a member yet, but visiting somebody you know, after church, I came with, uh, with a friend and invited us to their house. It was on the way, oh, you can come, come over, you know. That's how we should be, you know, being friendly, inviting a, each other to do things and such. And that's how we, how we grow closer. I know the, the marshals are very, very welcoming. Every, about every Sunday, it seems like, get together and, and just enjoy each other's company or people we get together and have Bible studies or go fishing, hunting, even though sometimes it's, doesn't really yield a whole lot, <laughs> but it's a good time nonetheless, and we need to keep up that, that good work. And the final one we need to be a friend to is Jesus. He was the ultimate friend because he died for us when we didn't deserve it. And turn with me to Romans 5 and in verse 8. 
Romans 5 and verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, even before we were here, God knew that we would need a Savior, someone to save us from our sins. Because he knew that we would eventually sin and would need that, that innocent blood, that sacrifice. How many of us would die for someone who has done us wrong? Well, Christ did. Think about when he was going through the, the trials and the tribulations and, and the crucifixion. When he's hanging on the cross before he died, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he was treated so badly, and yet he still, he still wanted God to forgive them. Are we willing to do that with our own, our own fellow humans, our own Christian, Christian brethren, at, at the best? But it doesn't matter, everybody, Christian, non-Christian, surely we can, we can forgive them if Christ did. Because after all, he was spat upon, he was beaten, he had a crown of thorns placed on his head, bones were broke, the list goes on. And, but he showed us the ultimate love in John 15, 13, and 14. John chapter 15, verses 13 through 14. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So we can see that we are... Christ's friend if we do what he commands and he has commanded us to go into all the world after his crucifixion before he ascends to spread the gospel and we can see in Mark 16 and 15 Mark chapter 16 and in verse 15 <clears throat> And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then also in verse 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So we can see that by being his friend, we, we need to do his will, spread the gospel. We need to be, also be baptized. And by being baptized, we are saying, yes, Jesus, I will be your friend. And you're making a lifelong commitment to Christ when you are baptized. So be a friend to Jesus, and he will never leave you nor forsake you. So if you have once been the, a friend of Christ, been baptized, and, we, and heard the gospel, confessed your sins, re, or repented of your sins, and confess that Jesus is the Lord and Savior and have fallen away or have not yet been baptized for the remission of your sins or have any other wants or needs uh, or prayers of the congregation, come forward now while we stand and sing.